بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته مساء الخير للجميع باسمكم جميعا وباسم نرحب بجميع الحضور اليوم لدينا ضيف قادم من سيرن نعطي نبذة عن سيرن باللغة العربية للناس الموجودين سيرن عبارة عن أكبر مركز أبحاث في العالم سيرن بدأ قبل ستين سنة لسيرن إنجازات كثيرة في مجالات كثيرة العلوم والتكنولوجيا احنا في البحرين في مركز ابحث وجامعه البحرين بدانا نعمل من سن منذ خمس سنوات لدينا ايضا انجازات مع سن في تدريب الطلبه وفي الابحاث وفي المعارض العلميه واخر شيء كان المعرض العلمي في الرياض سن الرياض كان معرض جميل جدا اليوم سوف يتكلم عن اكبر جهاز في العالم أكبر جهاز علمي الإنسان صنعه فحتما هذا راح يفيد الجميع في مجال العلوم الأساسية وفي مجال التكنولوجيا كيف صنع هذا الجهاز ولماذا صنع هذا الجهاز وكيف يعمل هذا الجهاز عبارة عن أسئلة كبيرة جدا هدف هذا الجهاز البحث عن مكونات المادة ومكونات الكون وهذا شيء جدا مهم للتطور العلمي المستقبلي سؤال go to English <تصفيق> Uh, it is uh, my pleasure to welcome you all. Uh, good evening to everyone. And uh, w today we have a guest from CERN, uh, Martin. Martin got his MSc and BSc in physics. Uh, he joined CERN in 2003, so he is completing 20 years at CERN. Now he is a staff member of CERN and he is advisor of CERN for Middle East and North Africa. And he is uh, also advisor of joining all universities, all institutes in the Middle East to work with CERN, especially to work with CMS. And this is great for the Middle East and for anyone. To, to, uh, the aim of CERN is accelerate science, and in the Middle East, we want also to accelerate science and technology. Today, uh, Martin is going to speak about CERN first. What's CERN? What is this organization? And after that, he will go to LHC, which is the great uh, apparatus we have, great experiment. And also he is going to talk about the collaboration between uh, Bahrain and uh, CERN, and also all Middle East in future, hopefully. So uh, on the behalf of all, uh, it's our pleasure to be here, and we hope to see you again and again in Bahrain. And he's very well-known person at the university and everywhere. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Martin, for coming. and. Please start your lecture. Thank you very much. Shukran. Masai uh, Khair. So, let me get on the stage. So, I'm very happy to be here tonight. Um, it's not the first time, actually, I've had the pleasure to be here a few times already. Uh, but it's a uh, fantastic premise, I think, to, uh, to give talks. And uh, I feel very fortunate to be here. So, thank you very much for the organizers. Um, this is a oops, yeah. This is a talk, yeah, about CERN uh, and CMS. It's an introduction, so I'll keep it at a, a level that is, I hope, not too technical. Um, in fact, the story of Bahrain and CERN started on a very specific day. It was in 2019, not far from here, when we uh, inaugurated the an exhibition about CERN. And that was also sponsored and organized by the Sheikh, Sheikh Ibrahim Center. Uh, these are a few pictures of, uh, of that event. As you can see, it was already quite well in, uh, attended. And on that very same day, we were lucky. It was really coincidence, I have to say. Uh, the, uh, the, the sometimes, you know, all the lights are green. And on that very same day, the University of Bahrain received from the spokesperson of CMS the letter of affiliation. So that was really the, the kickoff of two very important milestones in the relationship between Bahrain and CERN. And so we are here a few years later, and what do you know, just a few days ago, uh, we were in uh, Riyadh with, us, with another exhibition about CERN, very similar to the same one, and still at the um, initiative and with the support, or the support of the Sheikh Ibrahim Center. So that really I would like to uh, acknowledge the contribution of that entity 
in the Gulf, uh, really working tirelessly about for the promotion of science and certainly to fostering the relationship of the region with CERN. We, we need that and we really appreciate it. So this particular uh, event uh, tonight is part of a larger event, which is a two-day info day, as we call it, or roadshow, where we are giving uh, talks about CERN and also about Sesame, which is a, a light source based in uh, Jordan. And Sesame and CERN have a very close relationship. Um, CERN was part of the team setting up Sesame from the onset, from its inception. So it's a, it's a real pleasure to be able to match these two organizations in, in one same event. And so tomorrow night, uh, you're also going to have uh, here, at the same time, uh, the pleasure to hear about Sesame. Today was about CERN, and so uh, let me start with uh, our organization. This is a top view of the region of Geneva in Switzerland. Here you recognize uh, Lake Geneva. This is the airport of Geneva. What is interesting here is to see this red line, which in fact is the border between France and Switzerland. So what the first thing that you can see is that we are in a region that has very close proximity between two countries. And as it turns out, the main campus of CERN is this triangle here of urban area. So what you see is that the border crosses through our campus. But for us, it's irrelevant because, in fact, the land on which the campus was built was donated by uh, France and Switzerland. So when you are inside the campus of CERN, you don't see the border. You, you move freely. But that was not enough. And over time, CERN had to expand because we were building accelerators that were always bigger, and we needed to other campuses. And today, this white line that you see here is the footprint of our flagship collider, which is the LHC. And this is 27 kilometers. And as you can see, it crosses the border quite a few times. On top of it, we have some dedicated sites, uh, like the one here. So we are really having various campuses all around the region. And we need that because we have a, a big mission. Uh, we are trying to understand the most fundamental uh, particles and the laws of the universe. So it's a big mission. And for that, you need research infrastructure that are quite unique and that certainly are very big. When we say 27 kilometers, it's not necessarily visually easy to put it in context. So I stole a slide from uh, one of the lectures this morning. Um, and this is the distance, for example, between Bahrain and the coast of Saudi Arabia, to give you an idea. And uh, as the, uh, the speaker was saying uh, this morning, if, you, if we were to put... Oops, what's happening? Okay. No. Maybe I'm too... Ah, here we go. If we were to put the LHC on top of uh, the map of Bahrain, uh, you can see what it would represent. So it is a, <laughs> it is a fairly big uh, inf piece of infrastructure. And um, ah, hold on. One implication of that, if you're working at CERN, is that as long as you're, uh, you're working around the main campus, where all the workshops are, where the administrative services are, where the restaurants are, where the hotels are, you're OK. In my case, I worked here. So needless to say, when you leave your office, you better make sure you have not forgotten your toolbox, your hard hat, your safety shoes, because this is about 30 minutes by car. So if you arrive up here and you realize that you've forgotten your dosimeter, well, you just lost an hour. Yeah? And that was in the construction of the detector that uh, we're going to talk about, CMS, that was a real constraint. Our friendly competitors, Atlas, had it a lot easier, because that's where they are. I'm not saying that, saying that we, we were the best, but you know, we, 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 had, we started this adventure with at a disadvantage. This is, of course, uh, to, for, uh, for a joke, but this also gives you an idea of what it means to be working at CERN. You are a lot in your car. You need to be in many places during a day. And 
even though we, we say we're in Geneva, uh, frankly, you can see it's sparsely, it's sparsely populated. There is no direct road between the different points, so we have to use uh, fairly small roads. All this takes time, all this t uh, puts also traffic onto the area, and that's also something that is important for us. We are always trying to be as invisible to our neighbors as we can. Because we are 18,000 at CERN, it's a lot of cars, it's a lot of people buying property, also a lot of people consuming, but you know, we're trying to have very friendly relationship with our neighbors because we have facilities that will need to grow. So it's very important that we get the support of the local communities. And you will see in a minute that we are significantly investing to communicate to our neighbors and try to bring them into, into our projects. So this I can skip. Here we go. So um, I'm going to talk about four um, mi different missions of our organization. I'll start with research first because this is our uh, raison d'etre, really. But I'll also talk about collaboration, because CERN has been around for more than 60 years. Um, we have a, a governance model that is not intuitive. It's a, it's all based, I mean, a lot of it is based on finding compromise, finding common ground, collaborating. And that's also something that we <laughs> somehow exported <laughs> to Sesame. I mean, the idea is, it is different. As scientists, we believe that we have enough common denominator for our, because of our passion for science that we can use a collaborative model a lot in our, in our daily work. Then I will talk about technology. Um, what is important to remember is that CERN, because of the kind of activity that we have, um, we cannot buy our tooling and our, our equipment off the shelf because a lot of it doesn't exist off the shelf. Uh, we are doing things that are so specific that there is no market for what we would like to buy. So we have to develop it ourselves. And finally, I'll talk about education and training because this is in fact what brought us to approach Bahrain. We work with uh, universities a lot. We have about 700 partner universities across the world. So it's very important for us that we have a, a very strong relationship with academic institutions so that we can exchange students, uh, train them also to be the, uh, the talent we need for the future of science. So let me start with, um, with research. Uh, I think maybe the battery has died. Oh, okay. All right, let me start with research. So, um, what we call a, an experiment at CERN is something a bit uh, different than what you would call an experiment in, in, a, in a lab. Uh, this is the, uh, the a colleague, and this is what we call an experiment. It's like a gigantic detector. Um, this is just to put things in perspective. All this happens underground, right? When we are uh, installing equipment to work together with, a, with our particle accelerators, we, it is underground, just to prevent having radiation in the open. But this is fairly big. As you will see, I've got a, a video that is, mm, that is also quite useful. So what are we trying to do? Well, essentially, we're trying to understand what, you will, what, what there is when you zoom into matter. Right, so you, we, we all know the atom, and then you, inside the atom you've got the nucleus, in the nucleus you've got the protons, neutrons, and then inside these you've got quarks. Uh, how does it all fit together? That's what we are trying to understand, and we try to understand that by colliding, so accelerating protons to about the speed of light, and then colliding them. And the idea is that with the famous uh, equation E equal mc squared, the energy of the two incoming protons will be transformed into new matter. And sometimes, if you're very lucky, this new matter is something you didn't know until now. That's what we call a discovery, when you prove that something that you didn't know actually exists. Okay. So, another way 
to see the type of activities that we do is to think of us as a bit uh, like a time machine. You know, if you want to understand where we come from, what was at the origin of the universe, you can either use telescopes to look at the sky and trying to understand how all these celestial bodies are, are organized and are working, or you can try and recreate matter as it was right after the Big Bang. And that's our approach. There is, um, it's, it is a, a friendly competition between um, astrophysics and physics. And what we're trying to do is totally complementary to what our colleagues doing uh, astrophysics, um, what, what our colleagues doing astrophysics uh, do. So what we're trying to understand is how did the universe evolve? And by recreating matter, as it was very early on, you find the, in fact, the building blocks of, of, our, of our universe. We've been at CERN quite uh, fortunate, privileged, in fact, to work with Nobel Prize winners uh, in physics. And it doesn't happen every year, but we were lucky enough in 2012 to participate to the discovery of the Higgs boson. So how did the discovery work? So essentially, these, well, initially there were three uh, gentlemen. Uh, one passed away before 2012, unfortunately. But these two gentlemen, back in the 60s, postulated the existence of a particle that would explain why, what gives particles their mass. That was just a, I mean, just, it was a, a theory put on paper that gained a lot of attention, but it was a theory up to the point when, in 2012, we actually proved that they were right. So all the way from 1960 to 2012, we were step by step designing the equipment, the, the facilities that would allow us to prove this theory. That's really a long journey, if you think about it. And that's, that's another, maybe something quite unique uh, with, with CERN, is that the, the, the project cycles that we have are very long. Um, to come up with a facility like the one that we used to discover the Higgs boson, you need to build First of all, the, the, the tunnels, the caverns, you need to fill them up with magnets that you had to design. And then you need to have all the cryogenic system to keep this magnet very, very cold. Uh, you need then to design the detectors that are going to look at this matter. All this takes a huge amount of time because it is expensive, because you need an awful lot of talent put together to get to the design that is actually going to work. So that's why it took so long, if you like. Huh? And, yeah, and I can tell you, when we found it, we were also very relieved because all this money was given to us by our member states. Um, it would have been kind of embarrassing if we <laughs> hadn't found anything, right? I mean, this is uh, always the risk. This is research. Huh? You, you may find and you may also not find. So I think everybody was really uh, extremely happy on that particular day. To get to a discovery to get to the identification of a new particle, you need three things. You need accelerators. These are the uh, facilities that will accelerate the protons to about the speed of light and collide them. You need the detectors. That these are kind of extremely large 3D cameras, extremely fast also 3D cameras, to essentially look at what's happening right after the collision. What are the byproducts? Uh, of the collisions. And then, if you keep the analogy with a, with a camera, you need to look at the pictures taken from the detector and analyzing them. Because some of these pictures will tell you nothing new. And rarely, but it happens, fortunately, sometimes you will find something that is actually completely new to, our, to humankind and to our species. So let's start with the accelerator. So this is a, a view of what you would find inside the LHC tunnel. So here you are 100 meters underground. And you can see that the tunnel is, is bending, right? Uh, this is because we're using a, a circular collider. So the, the protons that are being used in these beams, they go around as long as they don't hit another proton, right? On average, 
it takes a, the LHC about a day to be depleted of, the, of, of so much proton that it's not worth it to keep the protons running. So then you dump, we say we dump the beam, so you empty the, the collider and you refill it. And then you get again a large number of collisions per second. Now this is these blue objects that you see here are, are not um, simple beasts, really. Uh, these are what we call superconducting magnets. Superconduc uh, superconductivity means that at a certain temperature, the material that they are made of does, is not resistive anymore. You know, the, the resistance is when you send a, an electric current into a resistor, it heats up. That, that's how you, for example, in a radiator uh, in your home, um, this is how you produce heat. But this heat, in fact, works against us because that means that you consume an awful lot of power. And because we need extremely powerful magnets to bend the trajectory of the proton beams, that was not an option for us. We needed a type of material that would not be resistive. We call it superconductive. So that sounds easy, but in fact, there are very few material that you can actually use for that. And what we had to do is to find one that we could also produce in sufficient, uh, at a sufficient level of quality and quantity to make thousands of these blue objects, these magnets. You have to imagine that a magnet like this, which is about eight meters long, um, has the job to slightly deviate the beam from its straight trajectory. So the, the proton will arrive in the magnet coming in a straight line and it will be given just a nudge, just a little tilt. And the next magnet will do the same, just a little tilt. And the idea is that then, when everything is operating, your protons keep run going in circle. That's when you've got your circular collider operating. But to do that, the all these coils that we see that make, in fact, the, um, the, 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 that produce the magnetic field that is bending the trajectory of the particle need to be cooled down. And they don't need to be cooled down like in a freezer. They need to be cooled down to the temperature of outer space, uh, a, a few kelvins above the absolute zero. So that in itself is unique on our planet. I mean, we, inside one of these uh, magnets, you find superfluid helium. So, you, helium is a gas, you know, it's a byproduct of uh, oil extraction. This gas can be turned into a liquid, and in a, so under particular conditions, it's, it's even superfluid, which means that it goes into all the, if it fills all the cracks, all the, all the available volume. Well, this <laughs> liquid helium is about minus 273 degrees centigrade. It is in fact, colder than outer space. So you have to imagine that you need a system to keep 27 kilometers worth of magnets at the temperature of outer space. Right? In itself, it's ne it had never been done. It, is, it was a huge challenge. Uh, it is like a, a gigantic freezer, if you like, for 27 kilometers. This alone uses an awful lot of power, uh, but still, it's much less than if these magnets were not using superconductive material. Uh, to put things in perspective, uh, Geneva has 250,000 inhabitants. At CERN, we use more energy than the entire city of Geneva. Right? So, the, the power th that we are, we are using every day is, is very important. It, we, are, we feel very responsible for it because it's essentially what uh, a city would need. So, this is for the, uh, the, the, the accelerators. And then, this, so, oh yeah, here it, I can actually show you how you fill up the LHC. So, how do you get the beams into these 27 kilometers of tunnel? It all starts on our main campus with um, hydrogen gas. So, very simple, it comes in a bottle. Then, Hydrogen, you will, uh, to, to get the protons, you will eject the electron from these, these atoms of hydrogen, so you've got only the protons, and then you start to accelerate them. 
And the idea is that you go first for, with, uh, through a fairly small uh, circular accelerator, then you inject into a bigger one, and eventually you inject into the LHC. Right? And if you could look at the beam, or take a picture of the beam, you would see bunches of protons separated by 25 nanoseconds. Right? And this is filling the old 27 kilometers. And as long as you don't collide, they keep going around happily. But of course, that's not what we want them to do. What we want them to do is to collide. And there are four collision points. One is in Switzerland, and the other three are in France. The one I'm going to talk the more about is, again, the, the CMS one. In these four locations, the two beams that, were, that would otherwise cross without seeing each other are made to intersect, are made to collide. And this is when we get the, 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 the mechanism to produce potentially new uh, particles. If you look at the output of what a detector uh, sends uh, after a collision, it would be something like this. This is what we call an event. It is a 3D reconstruction of the signature left in the, into the detector by the biparticles, the part particles produced after the collision. The yellow lines here are the trajectory of charged particles. And these green and blue uh, bars, they represent the amount of energy that the particles had when they left the collision point. The way to, to measure these is because we have a, what we call um, calorimeters, so they are, it's, it's a thickness of material through which the particle is going to go, and when it crosses the material, it will break, and when they break, particles emit light. And this is for the, for the talk tomorrow where about sesame, you will see that it is something that we, uh, we need very much. Um, in our case, that allows us to understand the properties, this, the, uh, uh, to identify the particles that have been produced at the collision point. And this is happening very, very fast. Huh? It's one billion particle collisions per second, billion. So you can already imagine that uh, there's no way we're going to be able to look at all this. So the, these experiments, these detectors, um, they are like... Uh, an analogous uh, pictures, if you like. Uh, I already said, we, they measure energy and, and direction and, and trajectory. What is in important here, what is interesting also as an intellectual challenge, is that since we know we can't possibly look at everything, because it's one billion, two billion, three billion, I mean, no, no computer, no, no system will be able to look at everything. So we need to drastically lower the total amount of data that we will take a look at. And this happens very early on in what we call the data acquisition process. So we will go from 40 million pictures, so from 1 billion, already 1 billion, not everything is going to deserve a picture or will, be a, we will not be able to take a picture of everything. So we take about 40 million pictures a second, which is already a lot, but only 1,000 of these 40 million are actually going to be stored to then be analyzed. And that's a, a tough job. How do you decide to go from 40 million to 1,000? So the way it works is that our colleagues from the, the, the world of uh, theoretical physics have put on paper, uh, have designed all sorts of theories about particles that might exist, or, or mechanism that might exist. Then the job of uh, the, 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 uh, the um, applied physicist is to take these theories and imagine if this particle existed, what would be their signature into the detector? What would they look like? What would the response or the si of the detector to the, um, the, 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 the creation, the, uh, the, the existence of a particle like this. Based on this, 
the computer scientists are taking this prediction of signature and loading them into computers. And when the data comes out of the detector, we, even before they are reconstructed, uh, you know, just like a blur, to take the analogy of a picture, it's like you're getting a blurry picture, and the computers will compare this blurry picture with all the models that have been loaded into the computer. Meaning that from the very early on and very quickly, you discard, you throw away all these pictures where you, you don't really believe there is anything of value in it. Now, the, the catch is that we don't know whether we have thought of all the possibilities, of all the potential particles that exist. If, we have, if there is a something completely new, a new particle, that is created by the collision, but nobody thought about it, or it has not been loaded into the computers, then you're actually throwing away discoveries. So it's a very fine line between in, in this filtering process. You know, uh, if you're not careful, if you let's say, if your filter is not selective enough, you are overwhelmed with too much data. If your filter is too selective, you might be throwing away Nobel Prizes. Nobody wants that. <laughs> so that's a, a real challenge for uh, our community, from the theoretical physicist all the way to the um, computer scientist. What is also interesting about these detectors, these uh, experiments, is that they are not built at CERN. They are built all over the world. Uh, the, 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 we call that collaboration. The group of universities and research centers that are producing the parts that make these detectors come from absolutely everywhere. What they do is that they then send all the parts at CERN, and then this is where the detectors are assembled and operated. So you can imagine that when you've got uh, an object that is the size of CMS, so we're talking 14,000 tons worth of equipment, and this has been essentially uh, produced uh, all over the world, there is a, an awful lot of work to, to, to make sure that, first of all, the quality is what it needs to be, but also that the parts fit together. You know, it's like a puzzle. You've got one piece of the puzzle uh, in India, another one in Latin America, another one in Europe, and when they all come together at CERN, it all needs to fit. So that's also a big effort in, in, um, in the collab collaborative spirit of, this, of these uh, experiments. This is a picture of the CMS detector. Um, this is in an open configuration, uh, because Th when we are running, when we are taking data, when the collisions are taking place, they happen somewhere deep here. But the, the collisions create an awful lot of uh, radioactivity, and that radioactivity really damages the material that is, and the equipment that is making the detector. So at least once a year, we need to repair. And when we repair, sometimes we need to also upgrade, make the detector even better. So we need to be able to access in deep inside the detector. And this is what we do when we are in this position. And to make you understand a bit better, I've got a little movie. I hope it's going to work. Yeah. So this is a steel frames that, are we, that were taken at the beginning of a, uh, of a shutdown, so when we are maintaining. This is 100 meters under the surface, and this is the detector. So to give you an idea, this is 15 meters in height, 15 meters across, 14,000 tons worth of equip equipment. The beam, that the beam pipe you're seeing here is the one that is bringing the two beams uh, colliding. And these things that are moving are essentially the parts of the detector that we are shifting in order to get to the most inner parts to, to maintain it. But these parts, uh, again, you have to imagine we're in a gigantic cavern 100 meters underground, and these parts are extremely heavy. This one is about 1,500 tons. And how do you move 1,500 tons underground? Well, you use objects, uh, hold on, this, yeah, the objects like this one, you know, the, the, uh, the orange one. These are what we call air pads. 
essentially what we're doing with these 1,500 tons is that we're going to put them, uh, we're going to put some air pads under them, we're going to lift the whole thing, so the whole thing is essentially floating in the air, and then you've got a jacking system to move them. But there is a catch. The thing is, the floor of this cavern is not horizontal. It is flat, but it's tilted by three degrees, something like three degrees. So it's not that simple. You can't just have 1,500 tons floating in the air on an incline, right? Otherwise, gravity is going <laughs> to help you get rid of it. So uh, it, even once these things are floating in the air, you still need to be extremely careful about guiding the movement of these parts. And, okay, th this requires an awful lot of, of people to work, so you, you can see my colleagues from time to time. Uh, these people, let's be clear, they are academics. They are people from universities. They are not people from CERN. Because an experiment like CMS is essentially a group of universities that have decided to get together for mutual benefit. And the mutual benefit is the operation of a detector. We got 150-something uh, universities in CMS. It's 5,000 people altogether. So when we need the resources, the manpower, to come and do some maintenance, these are people coming from university. All right, so we saw the accelerator delivering the beam. We saw the cameras, the detector taking the pictures. And now we, you need to analyze the pictures. Well, that's not an easy thing to do, because even if you only store 1,000 pictures per second, it's still an awful lot of pictures to analyze. Uh, the, the, the LHC and the detectors are running 24-7. We, we don't stop at night. The, the people, the academics who come and um, uh, take charge of the operation of the detector, they work in shift. Morning shift, day shift, night shift, all around the clock. So we need because of the vast amount of data, we need a vast amount of processes. And so we've got about a million of these. Uh, from the onset, it was clear these million processes could not be just in one place. It's far too risky. If you got a power cut, then you lost everything. So they are distributed in 42 countries and across 1, 000, uh, 170 centers. And in April, this is going to become 43 because we have a, a data center that we are uh, building or, let's say, commissioning in Lebanon. So that should be the 43rd. And any country is much, much welcome to come and join this analysis effort. So the idea is you produce the data and you store it at CERN, and then you send packages of data together with an algorithm that you want to use on this data all around the world. The, these computers are processing the data and the result is sent back to CERN to be consolidated with all the other results. So that in itself is also a, an innovation of CERN. We have a, what we call the grid. Yeah. So the idea is that computers can share their processing power through what we call the grid. All right, this maybe I'll skip um, just to mention that we are working also on the production of nuclear uh, isotopes uh, and, and some other uh, smaller experiments. Ag again, I think today we're just focused on, on the main one, which, uh, which is the LHC. There's another one that is part of CMS, but quite in a different environment. This is a picture taken of the Millikan detector. This is a, an experiment that is looking at trying to understand one of the things that is puzzling physicists for quite some time, which is dark matter. Uh, we today understand about 5% of the matter in the universe, which means that we are <laughs> vastly ignorant, frankly. Uh, it's good to remember that. So we are one thing that would really let's say, f push further our understanding of our universe would be to understand this famous dark matter. And this probably can't be done with uh, the, the common detectors, like, uh, or the one that we've got at the moment. So we have to think about something more exotic, 
and uh, different types of particles. And so this, th this particular experiment, which is very new, is looking at what happens about 30 meters away from the collision point. So if you like, the particles are flying through the CMS detector, but they carry on. And they go through rock, and eventually they go across these scintillators that are pointing towards the collision point. So this is actually in a, in a drainage gallery. So this was a gallery that was excavated during uh, the construction of the site, and it was only meant to collect the water coming from the shaft, because we went through a water table. But, as it turns out, it was very convenient to install this detector in it. And so it's pointing towards the interaction point, but across a significant amount of rock. That's because we hope, we'll see if we are right or not, but we hope that maybe there are particles that do not interact uh, uh, immediately and do not recombine themselves immediately into our detector. Maybe you need to be a bit further away. And that's what these, det these uh, detectors are looking uh, to, to try and identify. And this is a... I like it very much because this is relatively small and it's, it's still a, uh, a, an experiment with a lot of potential. And this is something uh, that we also invited the University of Bahrain to join because uh, we think uh, that... Uh, the, the, the skills are certainly uh, there, and it is a very nice step in physics uh, for, for the University of Bahrain. So, just to finish uh, the, the part on, on physics, to say that uh, we have plenty of questions that are still not answered, and even though we found the Higgs boson in 2012, um, don't worry about us uh, having nothing to do. I think there is work there for, for decades, and that's why we, we need all the the talent from young people uh, that we can find. Now, let me move on to... No, this I will skip because otherwise I'm gonna, you're going to shout at me, Miriam. So, uh, collaboration. All right. So, at CERN, um, we have uh, 23 member states. So, mainly in Europe, but we are starting to expand. I mean, Israel is also a member. And we've got also associate member states. And there... Um, we go a lot further than Europe. We've got Pakistan, we've got Turkey, we've got uh, India. So CERN, even if it was initially created in Europe, we are a true international uh, organization. So we, we have, there's no limitation to countries wanting to join us into our mission. And in fact, we have what we call co cooperation agreements, uh, with non-member states, and I hope I'm not going to regret it, but normally in April we should have one with Bahrain. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's be optimistic and positive. Normally, uh, in my next slides, uh, in, in May, I can put Bahrain somewhere here. Um, so we're always looking for new partnerships from all over the world. We have um, about 18,000 people, uh, uh, 18, people working at CERN, but only a small fraction of these 18,000 are actually employed by CERN. I mean, in, in fact, it's about 2,600. The rest are um, post postdocs, so um, young graduates, but in fact, the vast majority are like our colleagues from the uh, University of Bahrain, they are users, so they are people who are still employed by the university but working at CERN. And this is under this particular status, what we call user, that we have uh, at the moment three Bahrainis uh, working at CERN. Oh, okay. How does that work? Well, if you are working uh, in a so-called collaboration, so that you remember this is the group of universities working together on detectors. It doesn't matter if you are a member state or not. So universities here in this example, you know, the first three ones, they are European universities, they are uh, from member states, and China and the US are non-member states. But their universities can deploy their people and their cash. <laughs> no, we never say no. Uh, to the operation, maintenance, and upgrade of the detectors. And it is in this mechanism, th thanks to this mechanism, 
that Bahinis come and work at CERN with us. We have a, um, we're hoping one day to get to 50% of, uh, of women at CERN. At the moment, we are in 19.4, so uh, we, it's getting better every, every day. Um, and, uh, of course, we, we thrive to, to get to the, the magic number, the 50%. Um, in the way the collaborations work, because it comes from all over the world, it's not like um, a, a standard, a standard organization. We don't have like a CEO, CFO, no. We have what we call a spokesperson. This is somebody who is going to speak on behalf of all the universities that make the collaboration. And CERN itself has a, a governance model that is based on, on cooperation. And that same model was passed on to our colleagues from Sesame, but uh, tomorrow you will hear more, hear more about this. But just to say that uh, the, the, um, this governance model, even if it's a bit exotic, even if it's, it can seem a bit uh, maybe naive sometimes, you know, trying always to find compromise, but it's been working for 60 years, so we, we do believe that uh, there's something there to be, uh, to be proud of. All right, let's move on to technology and innovation. So, as I was saying, um, we, are, we must continuously innovate because otherwise you, you, we can't build what we need. I mean, the, the magnets, the superconductive magnets, they were designed at CERN, the first prototype were made at CERN, and once something works, then we can pass it on to industry. Uh, the, the web is a, is a good example of um, uh, this, uh, this mechanism. We created the web at CERN not because we were wanted to create an, an early internet, it's because we needed the web to connect the computers of our collaborators. And there are many examples in the field of, uh, of uh, medical applications that are working on the same principle. So we have accelerators technology for cancer therapy. This is a direct implication of the technology we developed for ourselves. But of course, if we can, pass on this technology to society, then of course it's our duty and, uh, and, uh, and our, 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 um, our pleasure to do it. So there are quite a few of these applications. Um, the, uh, okay, here we go. Uh, the idea is that since we are both making, our, or let's say, designing our accelerators and we are designing our detectors, all the technologies involved are mainly are into imaging, fast computing, and so on. And this is really what we are trying to, uh, to pass on. Let's move on to education. So if you look at the CERN population, it will peak at 27 years of age. That's because we've got a large amount of, uh, of students. We've got about 3,000 PhD students at CERN. And of course, all these people cannot possibly get jobs at CERN. Uh, but the good news is, 45% of them, even if they worked with us, uh, they find jobs in industry. So, you know, there is no um, contradiction between working at CERN, which can be perceived as fundamental research, uh, and finding a job in, in industry. Absolutely not, because the skills that you get uh, to, to learn at CERN equip these young people for the job market. All right, and on top of all this, we have many programs that are targeting uh, the younger colleagues. Uh, some of them are only for our member states, but this one in particular is interesting, and I will talk about it a bit later. That's the so-called summer program for, that, has, that is open to absolutely everybody. Now, this is an initiative that should open in 2023. We call it the Science Gateway. So this is essentially a visitor center. Uh, before COVID, it's not fully recovered, we had about 70,000 visitors per year just at CMS. But just to give you an idea of the, the interest, and we are extremely happy about it, the interest that we get from uh, the, uh, the general public. And so in order to really have even better conditions to welcome the public, we are creating this uh, quite spectacular um, facility. Uh, in there, you will find... Um, parts of detectors, you will find some uh, experiments to do for kids so that they understand a little bit what, what uh, we are doing. 
It is also a way for us to give back to the general public. We are working with taxpayers' money, so it's important for us also to explain to the, to the greater number what we do. All right, so um, now let's focus a little bit, and then I promise it's almost there, uh, about Bahrain. So we have, there are three ways that uh, Bahrainis can come to, uh, your Bahrainis student can come to CERN. One is through a, what we call the summer program. Um, this is a, an eight-week internship during the summer where students can be uh, are integrated into a research team on a, uh, on a, top, on a, on a real topic. The mornings they can follow uh, lectures, seminars, workshops, and the afternoon it's really hands-on uh, work with a, with a team. Uh, this is something that is open to uh, all Bahrainis. They need to have completed their third year of a university, and it's not for PhDs because, I mean, the idea of this program is to give an idea, to give an incentive for young people to go towards uh, science, engineering, uh, computing. Normally at PhD stage you've already made that decision. Option two is what we are doing extensively with UOB. So these are one-year internships uh, with the CMS experiments. It's for bachelors or masters. And the idea is that they are deployed again into a team, an existing team, on a real project, a critical project, in whatever field makes sense for uh, the, um, the university. So it can be in computing, in physics, or engineering. And there the idea is that the deans are the mechanism to get this initiated. And option three is similar, but it's just for PhD. It, it is specifically for PhD. So again, the idea is you start your PhD and you spend a few years um, at CERN uh, during that PhD. This is uh, very quickly a, a picture of the, the students that have come to us for um, a year or more. Ah, this time, I oh, know, okay. So the, the first one, uh, uh, it was a BSc student in mechanical engineering and he contributed to the design of a, a first, the first hardware contribution of, the, of Bahrain to CERN, which is a set of frames and a jig. Here you see them at CERN. So this was designed by Bahrainis, produced by Bahrainis, and it, is, it has now been shipped to CERN, where we're going to be using it for the next 20 years. You can see the Bahraini flag here. So this is, it was a, a very successful project, and I hope uh, that we will have the opportunity when we sign uh, the uh, ICA in April uh, to uh, also celebrate the, the delivery of this piece of hardware. Uh, this is the second student. He was also a mechanical engineer, but after he, he came after his master. And here he worked on uh, fluid mechanics, so the CO2 cooling systems, and on uh, safety. And this is a, the third one, so he's a software developer. He's still at CERN. He gave his talk this morning from CERN. Uh, working on uh, control systems for, for, the, for uh, a part of the detector. And finally, this young uh, gentleman here is a PhD student, so he was actually a master's student, and then he came back uh, to CERN. Uh, well, he was doing his master's thesis with us at CERN, interrupted by COVID, but then he came back as a PhD student, and he's working on, on computing. In your region, in the Gulf, uh, we have uh, a lot of collaborations already with uh, universities from other countries. Um, we see the m a lot of growth perspectives um, in this region. We, we know that the academic level is, is, ex is excellent, uh, that the, our experience with the student has been also outstanding. And so we are continuously trying to bring more uh, universities and students into uh, our, our environment. And uh, maybe the last slide is about Sesame, which we're going to hear about tomorrow. Um, one initiative is, is very important uh, between Sesame and Bahrain, is that uh, for the first time ever, this summer, two Bahraini students will spend eight weeks at Sesame. And uh, here, really, I think uh, we, we owe Sheikh Hameh a big thank you, because uh, the Sheikh Sheikh Ibrahim Center will sponsor one of these students. The second one will be sponsored by UOB. And we hope uh, that if uh, the students are, 
uh, uh, having a, a great time, then we can replicate that every year. I think it's important uh, to, to support this uh, unique facility in the Middle East. Uh, it is also a way for the, the, the scientific community of the Gulf region to discover that they have this fantastic tool at their disposal, really not far away. I mean, this is close to Amman. But this you will hear more about uh, tomorrow. Let me just finish by saying that uh, there is a long way to go before we understand everything about our universe. I'm sure we, I mean, I won't be there, I'm pretty sure. Um, but then again, uh, we appreciate your support. Uh, we appreciate your uh, interest for physics. It's, uh, we, are, we understand it's a niche uh, in today's uh, very fast moving world. Uh, but as a species, I think we need to get always better. And for that, we need to always understand more about where we come from and how our environment works. Thank you very much. Yeah, do you have any questions? Yeah, maybe there's a Q&A. Yeah. Uh, thank you for talking about the last achievement of the Higgs boson. Yeah. From 2000, from 2012 till now, there is no achievement like Higgs boson, yeah. although we have a lot of so this means that either the machine is now smaller than the achievements, and we have to look for larger machines, or physics reached some scale that it is very difficult to find. Uh, this is first. The second question, you said that particles are sk uh, they escaped from CMS, so that the new experiment will look for these particles. And we know that these particles, is, uh, the lifetime is being long. Mm -hmm. It should be mostly neutrinos or muons or something like that. So can we say that muon will be the structure of dark matter? Or it is early to say. Yeah, so th because muons, they are already produced into, into the collision point. So the yeah. muons are recorded in CMS already. So what we, uh, what we are hoping to see is, well, something different that would disintegrate a bit further. Yeah. But to be fair, we have been taking data. At the moment, it is a bit like the Higgs boson before 2012. Huh? We hope to see something. Uh, the just tuning, because you mentioned uh, between 2012 and now, not much has happened. Um, uh, tuning a detector to find a particle is in itself a, a huge job because you need to yeah. calibrate it, you need to understand its limitation. So a, a small experiment like Millikan um, will take some time to deliver potentially a, a discovery if there is something there. I think we are used to a new cycle that is very quick, but let's not forget it took between 1960 and 2012 to find the Higgs boson. The, we need to be very, very patient. Uh, the, it is, you're, you, you're quite right, uh, Mohammed. It is possible that the DLHC is not powerful enough yeah. to produce something new. It is possible. It is also possible that it does produce something new, but so rarely that you can't catch it. There's not enough statistics. That's also very, very possible. Uh, it's humbling to do research because sometimes, uh, sometimes you get results and sometimes you don't. Uh, but, Thank you. Uh, I mean, for sure, the, the future is towards a bigger, if we if we have the support of the, of the community, it would be a bigger accelerator. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know. I think maybe the theory and the models that are used to detect, they are not you know, developing to see interesting data. Maybe the, the data is there, maybe. but the predictions and the theories uh, is not actually pointing at them. So who knows? Absolutely, that's also a possibility. Yeah, you're right. 
Um, quick question. How do you deal with intellectual property ownership? You've got uh -huh. several hundred universities. The reason I was thinking is a digital detector for medical applications. Mm -hmm. Who owns the IP? Mm -hmm. How is the IP sharing done? Yeah. So we have decided to be open science, meaning that we, uh, we, our licenses are, are um, I mean, we, we, the IP will be the, pr so imagine that uh, five universities together develop a technology, right? So the, the IP is jointly uh, owned, CERN is, because CERN hosted uh, this, 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 I mean, it depends where the technology was developed. If it's developed at CERN, then CERN also is part of the ownership. Um, then there, there are two ways. It depends a little bit of what the universities want. We at CERN have this principle that whatever we, we find or develop should be open. So we've got uh, open software, open hardware licenses. We have the ownership, well, we have the IP, but free to use. For universities, sometimes this is more delicate. Um, in that case, it is really a case by case. Uh, what CERN always asks is that if a technology that CERN helped develop is later turned into a commercial venture, that CERN never has to pay to use it. So what about equipment ownership? Like you take the Bahrain jig that was designed, yep. who owns that? So the, the hardware itself right. is an in-kind contribution. So CMS owns it, but let's so remember... The ownership's transferred to you. Yeah, but, but, okay. but you, it's not CERN. Uh, CMS is 150 universities. Right. Yeah, so collectively, Bahrain made a hardware contribution to this group of 150 universities, like the Pakistanis, for example, provided the steel to make a piece of CMS. This becomes a common property, the property of these 150 universities. But you're responsible for owning and operating it, maintenance, everything like that. Uh, what do you mean by you? Well. Sir? CMA, well, somebody has to find the operating costs, yeah. has, to, has so, to maintain it, has to take the liability issues associated with it, any piece of equipment there. Correct. So, so that would be CMS again. So w all the universities that are members of CMS contribute to a maintenance and operation budget. So you imagine that the 150 universities every year put a bit of money into this common pot, and that money is used to maintain, including the jig, I maintain CMS, including the jig. Right. Uh, thank you for the interesting talk. Um, I just had a thought in my mind um, that uh, you said that um, certain data and, uh, is open source, so it's free for everyone to use. You can access it, and I've been, uh, I've accessed it actually before. Even NASA does the same. It has the data from. Uh, open source, but um, then it came to me, uh, why uh, is it hard for, um, for example, students um, to, to get uh, an opportunity on CERN? Um, may, uh, it, it's not necessarily hard, it's behind a wall. You either have to be a part of an institution uh -huh. or you have to pursue a PhD. Yeah. So uh, since the data is open source, why isn't um, it's open to everyone to use and uh, contribute to CERN from that way. You can have, like, for example, an open source, and you can say that, oh, if you have any contributions, it's open. The website is open. You can access it, and then you can share your results with us. Um, usually, that's done by institutions, uh, individual members. I'm not sure about that. Uh, is there any, any opportunities for individual members to contribute to that or not? So. Uh, okay, I hope I understood the, your, your question. So the, the, the data that we collect, or the technology that we put out for the public, anybody can use them. However, in order to be able to come to CERN physically, I mean, to mm -hmm. come and use our facilities, to use our software, our 3D printing facilities, you need 
to be affiliated with an organization that has an agreement with CERN. That for plenty of reasons, the insurance, uh, the, um, the, um, the, the, the residence permit, work permit, we can't be just open doors. Mm -hmm. So if you like, it is true that uh, we, we, one might uh, wish that we were more open to everybody, uh, but, but there are some, some legal constraints. But already, I mean, today UOB is a member of the CMS collaboration, which means that on paper, anybody from UOB can come to CERN, right? Mm -hmm. It is true that if you come from another university that do, does not have an agreement yet, yeah, y you're limited. Yeah, uh, it, um, is there a way, for example, that we can have um, a, a third site, a third party, for example, that's approachable in, for example, pitching ideas? You can pitch ideas to that party uh, and it acts like uh, um, uh, how UOB acts now. Uh, for example, UOB can now send students to CERN. Yeah. Uh, so the same way, uh, I have an idea that I want to contribute. So I, I go and uh, uh, pitch that idea to that uh, party, and then the party will transform the idea to CERN, for example, mm -hmm. and you can, can have a discussion about it. Maybe that will be that will make CERN definitely mu much more open, and it will maybe solve the issue, the security issue, and th things like that. So, um, how would you imagine a world uh, that's more open to science like that? So. To be fair, uh, if you are from another university, um, nothing prevents that university to join a CERN experiment. There is no limitation. I mean, the, it's all a matter of establishing a, um, the, the mechanism to collaborate. So, but it, it's not a, a big deal. I mean, you, you, uh, if, if a university has the ambition to work with us, they apply. And, I mean, depending on the cases, but that can be fairly quick. It's, it can be m less than a year. And then everybody in that, in that uh, university uh, become eligible to come to CERN. It is true that as per the, uh, our regulation, our, our rules, uh, we only make uh, um, uh, agreements with academic institutions or research labs. Mm -hmm. So we could not have a company signing on to be part of a, of a, of a collaboration. But as long as you, you are part of a body which, which is dedicated to education or, or research, uh, there is no, there's nothing preventing that uh, that the organization to to apply, and and then, you know, once the agreement is there, then all the affiliates of that organization can come to CERN. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, you are doing your best in order to make this cooperation bigger and bigger and bigger. And this is our aim also for future. Especially now we have a new partner, mm -hmm. Sesame. We hope that we will start and be a circle in the region. Fantastic. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you.